Hello there and welcome to the Q&A show. My name is Cyrus Fernanda and I'm here every Monday evening at 10 o'clock UK time here to take your questions. This program is live and interactive and we always welcome you to send in your questions because we have a very special guest with us every single week. You've got the email information there, live at revelationtv.com. SMS details are there as well. And joining us tonight, we've got Pastor Derek Walker from the Oxford Bible Church. Pastor Derek, you there? Hello. Hi, Cyrus. Thank you so much indeed for joining us, Pastor Derek. Um, it's so wonderful to have you with us. And um, there's some things going on in the news at the moment, and I'd love to get your thoughts on it, really. And uh, this is it. And it's talking about the pastors who are praying right now for, uh, for Israel following Iran's drone and missile attack. <laughs> Uh, prominent Christian leaders worldwide are urgently calling for prayer and peace and security in Israel after Iran initiated a significant aerial assault on Israel, deploying hundreds of drones and missiles early on Sunday the 14th of April, intensifying existing regional tensions and putting Middle East closer to a broader conflict. Security officials reported the launch from Iran included over 300 drones, ballistic missiles and cruise missiles, an attack described by Israel's military as potentially escalating to major conflict levels, Reuters have reported. Despite the vast number of launches, Israel's advanced defense systems successfully intercepted the majority of these threats, as much as 99%, the Israel Defense Forces said. Prominent religious leaders have voiced their concern and called for peace. Pastor Greg Lowry of the Harvest Fellowship pointed to the biblical significance of the attacks as evangelicals. We want our Jewish friends to know that we stand behind Jewish homeland and her people. Laurie also mentioned on X that this attack is on the heels of the horrific attack from Hamas, which is a proxy of Iran of, on the Israel October 7th. He added, we pray that mighty God would protect Israel at this hour and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalm 122, 6. One of the signs of the end time is an increase of anti-Semitism and an increasing isolation of the state of Israel. We are certainly seeing this happen before our very eyes. Now, Pastor Derek, I'd love to get your insight into these recent attacks and also the biblical significance of Israel, please. Yes, the, uh, the Israel, of course, is very much at the centre of Bible prophecy. It's strange that many areas within Christendom seems to ignore that, because Israel is just not something in the past that brought forth Jesus, the Messiah. Israel is very much in the centre of the future prophecies of the Bible. You know, Je Jesus will return to Jerusalem when he returns. So that's significant. And there are many prophecies that God will, although Israel has, of course, sinned against God and, and as a nation has not accepted her Messiah yet, the prophecies are that God is going to bring her back to the land, first of all, and then he will bring her back to the Lord. And so there are two stages to the restoration of Israel. And, yeah. of course, in 1948, with the rebirth of Israel as a nation, we've seen these prophecies coming to pass. Exactly. But the prophecies also talk about the fact that when Israel comes back in, in the land, yeah. partly because she's still in unbelief, she's going to come under attack. She's going to have trouble especially from her neighbors. And Psalm 83, in particular, and there are two phases to this. Psalm 83 describes in attacks by the neighboring nations, the inner ring of nations that... that Exa yep, exactly. We're going to get you... C carry on in a moment, please, Pastor Derek, but I just really want to encourage our viewers as well. We're live and interactive, so whatever your comments are on this particular... or questions more about the biblical significance of Israel, that is what we're focusing tonight on all the questions and answers. But if you've got any other questions, you're more than welcome to ask us. Please do continue, Pastor Derek. Yes, I, I was saying that there's, there's, like, two major prophecies of what will happen you know, after Israel's reborn as a nation in the land, but before she actually comes to faith and accepts Christ, which is actually the, the catalyst for the second coming of Christ. And the first one is Psalm 83 that describes her being under, attacked by um, uh, the inner ring of nations surrounding her. And um, I've, I've done a video on Psalm 83, by the way, but 
you know, uh, this has been fulfilled since 1948. There has been this kind of confederacy of nations that have tried to attack and destroy Israel. And Psalm 83 is really a prayer that, that God will give Israel the victory against these. And that has been fulfilled a number of times up to now. But there's also a second uh, prophecy in Ezekiel 38 and 39, which is an out, a different set of nations. We, you could call the outer ring of nations. The leading ones named are Russia, Iran, and Turkey. And uh, that, of course, has not yet happened yet. I've written a book about it called The Imminent Invasion of Israel. And what I believe is that we have been in the Psalm 83 phase, and, and most of the neighbors of Israel now have been defeated by Israel. But what remains is Hamas and Hezbollah in, in Gaza and in Lebanon. Um, but at some point, it's going to, there's going to be a tipping point, and the prophetic scenario is going to move towards Ezekiel 38, which involves the outer ring of nations, including Iran. You see, up to now, Iran hasn't attacked Israel directly, but only through her proxies, yeah. you know, like Hezbollah and Hamas and so on, yeah. and the Houthis. So, um, did I get that right? Yeah. So... This, the reason why this could be a very significant moment in the development of prophetic history now is that this is the very first time Iran has attacked Israel directly. That's an outer ring nation attacking Israel directly. So this it could be a game changer. And that's why, yes, it, it's vital that we pray, because we could be at a very key moment now that that the that we're moving into towards the Ezekiel 38 scenario. Uh, do check out my book called The Imminent Invasion of Israel. And, and that's when uh, everything's going to go up a level. So uh, it could be that we are uh, you know, close to, you know, a big um, change, mm. a major important mm. change in what's going to take place. But through it all, God is working his purposes out. Amen all right? God is still working his purpose. And that is primarily, centrally, the salvation, not just of the Jewish people, that is very important, but there's also the salvation of the Muslim world that on the whole is that that which is attacking her and and that we pray that they will all see that yeshua is the prince of peace he's the only way there's going to be peace uh, and the more people who turn to the prince of peace you know that that is that is going to be the ultimate outcome mm -hmm. and future through all this mess Amen to that. Thank you for giving us some hope as well, Pastor Derek. We've got an email here from Les who's asking about Israel and also Iran to say, hello, Cyrus and Derek, having considered the various options about what Israel should do in response to Iran's direct attack on them, I would say that Israel's priority should be completely to destroy Iran's nuclear facility. What if one of those missiles had gone through um, and had been carrying a nuclear weapon? What do you think, Pastor Derek? Yeah, it's a very difficult one, because if, if Israel doesn't respond at all, they'll look weak, which will then eventually lead to more and more attack, emboldening the enemy. Um, the, it sounds the, the they might they might go after is, uh, Iran's oil industry or um, they might go after some nuclear sites. The, the problem with the nuclear sites is it's not an easy thing to do. And I got a feeling that they would need American help if they were going to really be effective in knocking out the nuclear sites. So that that is not borderline uh, very difficult um, to achieve that. But yes, they could, if they go in with a strong response, but then that will lead to all-out war, and that, mm. that could be the Ezekiel 38 situation. I've always had it as my guess that the catalyst that will bring on Ezekiel 38 might well be an Israeli attack on 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 the uh, nuclear, um, Iran's nuclear uh, plants. So um, we, we, we shall see, but it, they need to pray for wisdom, really, for Israel's leaders, that they find a way of responding that, that hopefully will not escalate things further. But sometimes you, you can't control the consequences. You know, how, how, do, how do you—each one is going to respond 
You know, if Israel responds, Iran's going to respond. And it's very difficult to see how that's not going to just continually escalate into full-out war. Yeah. Um, and so we, we'll just have to, and that, that could pull in, uh, as I say, Russia and other, and, and America and, and so on. So well, our win from South Wales, well, yep. Our win from South Wales is basically saying, Derek, uh, praying for Israel and thank you for the truth. God bless you. Our win in South Wales. Thank you, our win for that. Um, this also has written in from Paul to say, uh, do you think Israel's extreme attacks on civilians and Iran's backed groups, they knew they were setting a major conflict, drawing in USA and Britain. Given Iran has been supporting Russia, it is likely that Putin will support them. I'm sure Israel leaders know what they are doing. And that is from Paul. Yeah, I mean, the Ezekiel 38 prophecy does have Iran aligned with Russia. And so we can see that's been taking place. So that, that will not be a surprise. Um, but, yeah, it's, I mean, Israel's in an almost impossible situation. They have to, you know, they, they essentially want peace. Yeah. But when you're faced with an aggressor like uh, Iran and its proxies, you have to show yourself strong. You, you dare not show weakness in the face of that kind of enemy, you know. So, um, and then, of course, when Israel is, uh, does that, it, it, and especially with Hamas using civilians as human shields, and that, that, then, that, then the world press just uh, attacks Israel for trying to root out this, uh, this evil. I mean, you look at, you look at how did Hamas uh, manage to build all those tunnels and all those tunnel works, get all the weaponry. I'm talking hundreds of millions. They were clearly funded some way. And obviously, we're talking about Iran as well and Hezbollah and other organizations who have been involved as well. So we've got the evidence there. But why is it we're turning on our news at some times and they're not quite as accurate as we, as we should see? Mm. Yeah, well, there there is a. I think in any other it, people treat Israel differently from any other nation. You know the kind of scrutiny and everything else, uh, and there is a kind of latent anti-Semitism in the world mm. that these this kind of situation brings out. John has written in to say, we all know Israel will be set free. Exodus 14, 4. God will fight. Thank you, John, for that. Also, Shirley's written in to say, hi, Cyrus and Pastor Derek. I've read The Imminent Invasion of Israel, a very good book. There is seven years clearing up from the Psalm, uh, from the 83 war. So is the Ezekiel 38 war likely to come after a quiet time? Or is it more likely to go straight into a war? Thank you and God bless from Shirley. Yes, I mean, we, we don't really know, uh, to, be, to be honest. Um, there is a seven-year period afterwards, which is why I believe it's not the Battle of Armageddon, because that's really it takes you right up to the second coming. So it's, it could be at the end of the church age. It could be early on in the tribulation. But I think it will probably be in the church age. I, I think we'll probably see it ourselves. Um, but, it, you know, things happen very quickly. So there may be a short time of peace and then suddenly it, you know, that, that, will, that will happen suddenly. Um, it's hard to know. OK, well, Linda's written in some, a question as well. Dear Osiris and uh, Pastor Derek, thank you for the programme. Always lots to learn. My question is regarding the concept of soul ties. Do you think the idea of breaking soul, tie, soul ties is biblical? Thank you from Linda. Yeah, I mean, the Bible doesn't exactly use that the terminology soul tie, but I think we understand what that means. It's when somebody um you one can be in an in unhealthy addictive codependent relationship as it were and you're bound to this person and but it's not a godly soul tie you know like a marriage but um and and then you have to you know or one's been in a sexual relationship that one hasn't you know uh, shouldn't have been in and so you you, your soul is still attached to that other person in some way uh, through through that sexual bond. And, and therefore, you need to bring it to the Lord in prayer for, for God to cleanse you from that, you know. And uh, God will do that if if one comes in repentance and uh, humbly and asking God to cleanse you from and free you from that soul tie. <clears throat>
Okay, Dave has written in to say hi to you both. We know God created the universe, the observable uh, universe, approximately 93 billion light years in diameter. Could that be where our universe ends and another begins? As the Bible only says, God created it, but doesn't say how. Um, didn't say how big. And that is from Dave. Yes, I mean, we, we can only see so, so far. So we can't be sure exactly how big it, it is. In fact, God actually told us that in, in Jeremiah, I think, that, uh, that man will never be able to measure the full extent of the universe. Um, and, and that was uh, actually one of the many scientific predictions of the Bible. Um, and therefore, the reason God did that, by the way, is to, to show what he's like, that he's big. You know, he could have made a small universe, but then we wouldn't be impressed with the, with the grandness and the, the greatness of God. So, yeah, we, we don't honestly know. We know that God created the universe with, with his word. He spoke it into existence. We, we know at least how big it is, but it could be bigger. Of course it could be. We, got, we can't know how big it is. But I think there's only one universe, as according to the Bible. He spoke the universe into existence. And when it's finished its purpose, God's going to destroy it. And then he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And we see that at the end of the book of Revelation. This one is from Chris, and he's written, say, good evening, Brother Cyrus and Pastor Derek. Chris from Penzance here. My question refers to those preachers who, th who thought they are genuine behind the pulpit and are fully anointed by God. The question is, we know that preachers are only human and need prayer, but can we put our trust in preachers who seem act unchristian outside of the pulpit when associating with one or more members of the church who have put their trust in him or them? And the church body may be only interested in showing the genuine side that is projected upon the platform or the sanctuary. Well, I think that is asking, you know, if somebody who's been in the pulpit is um, uses his position to abuse in some way um, uh, the people under him, um, and, you know, no, they, they, that should, if they do that, that should disqualify them from the ministry. Um, uh, you know, if they, if they are exploiting their, their authority, if you like, to, to, to abuse in some way, to take advantage of people, um, that, that's a serious sin. And, and Jesus said, you know, if anyone causes one of these little ones, which could be who believe in me, he says. In other words, young, younger believers to, um, to and, and brings them into offense through through the sin. It'd be better for them if, if a millstone was tied around their neck and thrown in the bottom of the sea. So that's what Jesus thinks about it. He also said, by your fruits, you will know them. A, a good tree will bring forth good fruit. A bad tree will bring forth bad fruit. And a good tree will not bring forth bad fruit, nor will a bad tree bring forth good fruit. So, in other words, if somebody is bearing clear bad fruit, I mean, not that we're perfect or anything like that, but if somebody is, you know, really bringing forth bad fruit, then, you know, they're a wolf in sheep's clothing, basically. They're pretending to be a good tree, but they're producing bad fruit. So, they certainly shouldn't belong uh, in the pulpit. But what about the importance of pastors sharing their own testimonies of how maybe they've, they're only human? Just like that viewer said, pastors, and well, they're only human. Maybe some of the struggles they've experienced in their own lives, how they've overcome them, and also the importance of, the importance of those testimonies as well. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 is, certainly that is certainly true. But, uh, sorry, I thought the question was about spiritual abuse. Yes. Uh, you know, that's different from, you know, I had a trouble. I had a bit of trouble with my anger, you know. But sure. God help me, you, <laughs> you know. But this is somebody deliberately taking advantage of, of someone in the congregation sexually sure. or abusing them, you know, mentally in some way. Um, and and so there are certain sins that you know cross a line. But absolutely, I'm not so good at it. But um, uh, you know, uh, my wife is more likely to open up about you know uh, 
frailties and things, and oh. that really helps people, you it know, does, to yeah. know that, you know, even people in the pulpit are, are human beings and they go through their challenges and, and so on, and that, that kind of encourages them. And it's a great so evangelical I, I tool as well, message. isn't it? For any viewers who say, I, I don't have the boldness <laughs> to go out into the streets and, and preach the word of God, but at least they can maybe just share their testimony and plant some seeds of how God has changed their own life as well. This next one here is from Albert. Albert in Scotland. Thanks, Albert. Um, <laughs> hi to you guys. I was recently listening to a lady called Gail uh, Ripplinger, who says that the King James Version is the only true version of the Bible and the Texas Receptus is the true text and not the Alexandrian text. Modern translations, um, I would appreciate your comments. That is from Albert. Yes, I mean, there, are, there is a group of people who are King James only people, but to say, I mean, there is an argument over which of the manuscripts should you follow. Um, the Textus Receptus, which was the majority of manuscripts, which the King James, the New King James, and so on are based on, and some of the more modern translations are based on other manuscripts, which there are fewer of them, but but some of them are older, um, you know. But to say that the King James is the only valid translation is, is to me, is absolute nonsense. You know, mm -hmm. I, I use I use the New King James myself because the thing is, a lot of the language in the King James is just out out of date now and hard for people to understand. Mm -hmm. So there is no one translation that is perfect. That that that's absurd. The only perfect thing is the original. Uh, manuscript that, that that was the the autograph it's called the the original thing that was penned in the Greek language and the Hebrew language. Mm. Every translation has its strengths and its weaknesses. You know you can't just idolize one translation and say that's that's the perfect one. King James is beautiful and wonderful, but uh, it is uh, difficult in some areas and. Uh, I, I like to check various translations if I'm studying a verse to uh, get a grip of it. This one's saying uh, from Maria to say, Dear Cyrus and Derek, we love the show every week. So informative and helpful. My question is, after the rapture was taken place, will there still be time for people to get saved after that? Absolutely. Uh, they, in fact, in the, the rapture will take place, I believe, in the Revelation context, takes place in Revelation 4. You see the church in heaven in Revelation 4 and 5, represented by the, 12, by the 24 elders who sing on behalf of the whole church of how they're redeemed from the blood, by the blood of the Lamb. And then in Revelation 7, you see all the people who are saved a multitude of people who were saved in the tribulation. Um, so one of the purposes of the tribulation is a great soul harvest. People, in a way, everyone will be given a final opportunity. They'll either receive the Lord or they'll take the mark of the beast. And so many will be saved. There is a verse in 2 Thessalonians 2 that, that seems to imply that... Um, you know, that, that they'll have had their last chance. But it's not talking about the tribulation. It's talking about when the mark of the beast comes in, when the Antichrist, um, in the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist manifests with signs and wonders and brings in uh, the great delusion of the mark of the beast. And, and of course, when somebody takes the mark of the beast, then, then, then it's too late for them. But no, many will be saved in the tribulation. We've got another one from Jenny as well. She's asking about the rapture and the seven-year tribulation period. Can Pastor Derek explain and clarify the significance of what is happening in Israel right now to the Ezekiel 38 prophecy and, to, and in turn how this relates to the seven-year tribulation period and the rapture? Please include, scripture refer, uh, include references to the role of the Antichrist and Jesus' triumphant return if possible. And that one's from Jenny. Well, <laughs> forgive me, it's asking for a bit a summary of Bible prophecy. <laughs> uh, what can I say? I, as I understand it, uh, the Ezekiel event could happen during the church age before the tribulation. We can't be sure because of this seven-year clear-up period. It, it could be before the tribulation or, or just early in the tribulation. Uh, I believe that 
this uh, Ezekiel invasion that's going to take place, God is going to step in and God will, will, as it were, fight for Israel. And at that point, that will be such an obvious act of God that it will be a trigger for revival. And I'd like to believe it might be the kind of trigger for the final revival of the church age. Wow. Um, then when we go into the tribulation, of course, that's described in detail. Daniel's 70th week talks about how the Antichrist will rise up in the church will be raptured. And then the first seal that's opened releases the Antichrist the, to, who goes forth to conquer. And Israel still is not is un, in unbelief and makes a covenant with the Antichrist for seven years. But then the Antichrist will will break that and desecrate the temple of God and put up an abomination of desolation. And he'll become a world dictator for three and a half years. And But during through this whole tribulation, Israel will be turning to God and will recognize and start believing more and more in Yeshua as her Messiah. Wow. And she will call on Jesus at... The Armageddon, as she is invaded at Armageddon, and it seems hopeless, she'll call on Jesus, uh, saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and Jesus will return at the end of Armageddon and will, you know, destroy the armies of the Antichrist and establish his kingdom on the earth. So I don't know if that's, you know, completely key scriptures on that or is in Matthew 24, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Daniel 9:27. Uh, whole, you know, Zechariah chapter 12 to 14, uh, Joel chapter 2 and 3, you know, it's a whole major area of prophecy. How important is it that we have, a, we start to see a revival or evidence of a revival? What needs to take place for this to happen? Because you look at the world today, it's lost. We've taken God out of every single corner of our society. What can we do to encourage a revival? It's 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 prayer, really, isn't it? That I think the a key to revival, I think, is the church needs to recover um, its sense of, of the holiness of God, and we need to obviously. Pr I don't think any revival happens without prayer, but um, I, I think that as we end, get, draw closer to God and seek God uh, for Himself. And just intercede, so give ourselves to intercession that God's spirit will be poured out on, on our land. Amen. And so, yeah, it's a thing of God. We can't control it, but we can certainly pray for it. We need it for sure. Amen to that. Derek Joe's written in to say, hi, guys. Pastor Derek, I heard you talk about your anger. I love the Lord, but I am very angry. How do you overcome anger? I, um, yes, I, I haven't, uh, my personality, praise God, you know, I can't take any credit for it, <laughs> but I, anger has never been my issue. I might have other issues, but I've, so I've never had to struggle against anger myself. You know, we all struggle against different things, but, um, the Bible says, be angry. You know, sometimes it's right, you know, we're upset by something that is not a wrong emotion, but it says, be angry, but sin not. Mm -hmm. Because often anger is such a strong emotion that if you, if you use it in a selfish way, you, you just end up causing a lot, a lot of damage. So one thing is to stay humble before God. Jesus said, you know, don't take, before you take a, um, a speck out of your brother's eye, look out for that log in your own eye. In, in other words, the, the log of judgment and anger. If you try and you move in that anger and you end up attacking someone and hurting someone, actually that is a greater sin than the than the issue you have with them. Mm. So, yeah, it's like with all sin, I would say, just my simple answer is you can't do it in your own strength. You have to ask the Holy Spirit. You have to say, Holy Spirit, Lord, I, I've had, a, I have trouble controlling my anger. Yeah. Holy Spirit, please fill me and give me the power, you know, to control this anger Amen. and to use it for good. 
I pray that that's really helped you there, Joe, because uh, it's not nice for anyone to have that anger. And I, pre I pray that you have that peace in your heart as well. And if someone is doing something against you, then you need to be praying for that person <coughs> and praying for their hearts to change. And I sincerely pray that your life can turn around and you'll find that inner peace through Jesus Christ. Okay, Pastor Derek, could you just tilt your camera up a little bit, Derek? We're just cutting off your top. There you go. Just it. There you go. Well done. Uh, this one's from John in Belfast. Hi, John. Good evening, gentlemen. I have been going through the valleys for a reasonable period of time. In the early stages of this process, I found matters extremely hard to handle. 18 months later, I now find myself in much stronger place with regards to my faith. Now totally accept and understand what God is trying to do. My question is this, because I am so much closer to the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, do you find that Satan and his forces of evil lift their level of satanic attack against you to break the relationship that is in place? Derek, your input and your wisdom is much appreciated here. If you can answer this question, John in Belfast. Great question, John. If I understood it right, that, that if your relationship with God gets stronger, that, that then the satanic attack will get stronger. To exactly. And... Yeah. Well, I think not not especially. I, I think what you need to understand is that's we are called, it says in Ephesians six, to stand. And in terms of the spiritual warfare, we, we stand by submitting to God and standing on God's word. And it's a wrestling match. And in the Greek wrestling, um, the, uh, the ancient Greek wrestling, the whole idea is to stay on your feet. The opposition doesn't hit you, but it tries to get you off your feet. So the enemy will try and get you off your stand for God. He'll try and get you off standing on God's word. So in, in the spiritual warfare, it's, it's, it's called the good fight of the faith, the good fight of the word of God. So we, we have to make a quality decision in our heart that no matter what comes against us, what attack we come under, I am going to stand I'll be loyal to God. I'll be true to his word. I'm not going to move. And I think often when when the enemy can see that we have made that quality decision, say, in a certain area, then he doesn't he often then won't will leave you alone because he knows he can't move you. Yeah. You know, so he'll he'll test you. And if you kind of seem like you're undecided, you, you'll certainly attract his attention. But once you make your stand, he may try. Yes, he may try and and push you over. But once he knows that you have made that quality decision and you're standing in the Lord and in the strength of his might, then then I, I think he will then move on. So the, the thing about going through hard times um, it, it actually, well, it forces us to go one way or the other. We either kind of quit or we go deeper in God and we hold on to God more and we stand on God more, wow. praise God. Amen. And um, and there is an evil day, it says in Ephesians, stand in the evil day. There is an evil day when it seems like the attack is, 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 is very strong and we just said, just keep standing, just keep standing and you'll come through. Because when we say stand in the word, on the word of God, that also means stand in the completed victory of Christ. Always remember that Christ has already defeated the enemy. And if, as you stand in the word of God, in the name of Jesus, you are in the victory. Amen. You're not trying to get the victory. You are in the victory. Don't let him con you out of that fact. You are an overcomer. You are more than a conqueror. Just keep your stand strong. Amen to that. Is there, a, is there a prayer or a certain scripture that we can advise our viewers if they are going through situations, just as that viewer has just stated there, what way can we give them a way to draw closer to God and strengthen their faith in Jesus Christ? Well, the classic scripture is Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 17, which says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And it goes on to describe the armor of God and and standing and having done all to stand that's my favorite scripture on that whole wow. area there 
Excellent. Thank you so much indeed for that. Uh, Paul and Ruth has written in to say, good evening, Cyrus and Derek. Joel 3 verse 10 seems to speak about plows being turned to swords and pruning hooks to spears. Uh, this appears to be a reversal of the words of peace as spoken in other areas of the Bible. Can you please explain? That's Paul and Ruth. Yes, I mean, that, that's a dispensational uh, matter. Uh, let me just make absolutely sure. Joel three, chapter three, 3, verse 10. I think this is a reference to, to action in the tribulation, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, so this... Uh, this is talking about Armageddon. So at this time, at the Battle of Armageddon, of course, the, the command to go forth is, you know, get your weapons, it's, it's time for war, you know. And so that's because the setting is the tribulation, the invasion of Israel by the armies of Antichrist, and so it's, it's war. Now, after Jesus Christ returns to the earth, he will establish his kingdom on earth for a thousand years, a kingdom of peace. And then there's these wonderful prophecies in, if I'm correct, it's in Isaiah 2, 1 to 4, and Micah 2, Micah 4, um, that talk about how all the swords will be turned into plowshares, which is the opposite. So it's a, t it's a timing issue. In the tribulation will be a time of war. But when Jesus returns, he'll establish his kingdom of peace. OK, thank you very much indeed, Derek. <clears throat> Susan's written in to say, Hi, Cyrus and Pastor Derek. Almost all of my friends, relatives and acquaintances are suffering from ill health. It's very sad and makes me feel downcast. The Bible tells us that Jesus came to give life in abundance and joy. Will we have this in this world or the next? Yes, he, he came for this, this life. It's, um, the context is the shepherd. You know, Jesus is the good shepherd in John chapter 10. And the whole idea is uh, that the, she the sheep hear his voice. And if the sheep will walk close to the shepherd, you know, he will lead us into green pasture. He'll lead us into fullness of life. So, part, part, you know, we do live in a messed up world. And, and of course, there is an aging process and all of, all of that. But Jesus wants us to enjoy health and, and abundance of life. He came for that, praise God, abundant life as well as eternal life. But yes, he does want us to be blessed now, but we have to keep close to the shepherd. You know, Psalm 23, he really was claiming to be the fulfillment of Psalm 23, which is set in this life. You know, he leads me in the path of righteousness. He, he restores my soul. Uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. But the, the, blessed, the sheep is blessed to the degree that he, they, he walks closely to the shepherd, follows the shepherd. OK, often we are like sheep who go astray. We go our own way and then we wonder why life isn't working out the way it ought to, because we're not putting the Lord first. You see, Amen. he said, if you seek me first, all these things will be added to you because Jesus is peace. Jesus is health. So if we want to be in health we, and, and in peace, we have to be close to Jesus. Amen to that. Stay in close fellowship with Jesus. Worship him Amen. every day. Take time in his presence. Amen to that. Thank you so much indeed for that. Uh, Regine has written in to say, um, Hi, Cyrus and Pastor Derek. Two angels got Lot and his family out of Sodom before it was destroyed. The question is, is there an account in the Bible about what happened to Lot after the incest of his daughters? That is from Regina. Um, we're not really told too much. He became the father of... Oh, I can't remember now. Is it Moab or is it? Anyway, one of those uh, one of those nations that part of Jordan. He, he, I, we're not told much about his personal life after that, not to my remembrance. But he did become a father of one of the nations that comprises modern day Jordan. 
This one's from uh, Paul and Dee in Sheffield. Thank you guys for writing in. Hi, Cyrus and Pastor Derek. Exodus 2, verse 15. Uh, Pharaoh tried to kill Moses because Moses killed the Egyptian slave master. Uh, why would Pharaoh want to kill Moses? Because he was adopted into Pharaoh's family and had higher status than the slave master. I would have thought that Pharaoh wouldn't care enough about the slave master to even think about killing his adopted son, Moses. And that was from Paul and D. Yeah, um, he wasn't. Uh, you know, Exodus 215. Yeah, I'm just double checking that. Uh, it's an interesting thing, actually, that Hebrews, um, he saw, yes, it is interesting that Pharaoh wanted to do that. But um, it, I think the issue is that Moses took sides with the, with the Israelites against the Egyptians. And he was like a major Egyptian leader. And here he is actually fighting for a slave. And in the process, killing, you know, an, an, an Egyptian. So obviously that would, was seen as an act of, of betrayal, really, choosing. Actually, Moses was choosing his own people, uh, you know, defending his own people, the Israelites. But in Pharaoh's eyes, he was betraying his Egyptian heritage by, by identifying with the slaves. And, uh, in fact, I don't believe Moses sinned in that situation. He was defending the life. Unfortunately, it meant taking a life, but he was defending the life of um, and Hebrews. In Hebrews 11, it actually comments on that situation when he actually made a choice because he knew there would be negative um situations it says when he came of age he refused to be called the sons of pharaoh's daughters choosing rather to suffer affl affliction with the people of god than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin and so on so he forsook egypt not fearing the wrath of the king for he endured as seeing one who is invisible so moses actually made a righteous action in that situation um even though it meant him taking a life, he was he was saving the life of of an innocent uh, slave. But yeah, mm. th that it was the the thing is it set it set a, that that could trigger if Pharaoh. I, my guess is that if Pharaoh did not take strict strict action, that that could you know create a slave revolt. You know, uh, if somebody high up like Moses taking such an action kind of undermines the whole authority system. So um, that might be seen uh, as a threat by this, uh, you know, that's my guess anyway. Okay, this one's from Ruth in South Wales. Hi to you both. Can you please tell me where the robe came from that Jesus wore that had to come out of the tomb as Jesus took off his burial garments? <laughs> um, well, of course, he was in his resurrection body there. So, it's it, you know, it wasn't. People in their resurrection bodies, I think, I would have been clothed. You know, it's a good, it's a good question, but it's really outside our experience. He, in their resurrection bodies, I don't think they wear the natural clothing that, that we have. So God would have provided some kind of clothing supernaturally, I suppose. Okay, thank you. This one's from Evelyn to say, greetings and God bless to you both and Revelation TV crew for all of God's business. I wonder if Pastor Derek could suggest a good Bible school as I'm looking to get deeper understanding. And that's from Evelyn. Well, it all depends where, where you live, of course. There are online schools. Um, I, I teach... If you're in the area, oh, well, one school that I think is very good is Coventry Bible School. I, I teach uh, courses in in that locally. But um, in terms of online Bible schools, I'm, I'm not really that, that, that familiar. There are various Bible schools that you can find online, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on that issue, I'm afraid. 
Katrina has written in to say thank you and just tuned in. My partner and I have been under a horrific attack in the last year. I can't begin to explain what's happened to us. I know that we were brought together by God and I know he's behind us, but we are going through hell. Your show tonight has been such a blessing. Thank you from uh, Kay. Thank you so much indeed. And a little message of inspiration. What can we tell up for, for Kay there, Pastor Derek, if they're going through such difficult times right now? What message of hope can we give them? So, so they're, they're, they're married. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. And yeah, all I could say is like a marriage is like a three-stranded cord, uh, according to Ezekiel, uh, Ecclesiastes 4, that if... The main thing is that God is the central strand. So as well as wrapping yourself around each other, um, wrap yourself around God. Keep God in the center of the marriage and ask God to fill you with your, his love and his strength to help you. And uh, I don't know whether the troubles are coming within your relationship or, or from outside. I don't know. But if, if things are coming from the outside, make, use those to bring, bring yourself closer together, support Amen. each other, pray for each other. And, and those hard times, those attacks can actually bring you closer together. Amen. So Amen. don't start blaming one another. If you if you're in situations, but but help each other in that situation, and and I always go turn to Romans eight twenty eight, which says, God works all things together for good to, to those who love Him, who accord according to His purpose. So just keep loving God, keep trusting God, and He will work even the bad things together for good. Amen to that. The Lord works in mysterious ways, and I just pray to you, Kay, and your, and your family as well, that you stay strong, keep your faith strong in Jesus Christ, because He's got the most amazing plan for your life, and you are going through difficult times right now, but stay close to Jesus, and He'll reveal Himself, and He'll give you that peace that you deserve. In Jesus' name, I pray that. Amen. Uh, this one's from Philip to say, Hi, Cyrus and Pastor Derek. I would like to ask if emotions and feelings can be influenced by atmosphere in public places. I find I have to speak in tongues, but some days it's very oppressive. And that's from Philip. Yeah, that, that's true. Um, there's spiritual activity in, in the world around us. And praying in tongues is, is a very, even if you just do it quietly under your breath, in, especially if you're aware of a, a kind of negative atmosphere, that helps protect your soul, because you're, while you're praying in tongues, you're you're trusting the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit fills you, keeps you full, keeps your heart full, and that protects your heart against whatever uh, spiritual activity is going on around you. So yeah, we the, the, there are atmospheres, and we should exercise atmosphere atmospheric control. Yes, by speaking in tongues, by speaking God's word and declaring God's truth. Um, and that way we should be in charge of situations. And sometimes we, we can bind. If we know that there's a negative force at work, we, we can quietly bind that in the name of Jesus and say, you will not operate in my presence. Mm. Toyin's written in to say, good evening, Cyrus and Pastor Derek. I need clarity about the land of Israel. While Israel is dominant throughout the Bible, how is it that the current land of Israel only became a country called Israel when Jews were allowed to call it their country in 1948? Is it the current Israel, the same place referred to in the Bible? How do we know this is truly the holy land? And that's from Toyin. Yes, I mean, there's there's no doubt that the land of Israel is essentially, because in the Bible it actually describes the borders, uh, and nobody disputes that. Um, the Bible describes the borders of the land, you know, from Dan to Bathsheba, and in, in great detail. And, of course, the Jews have always had a connection to the land down the century, even though they lost their status as a nation in AD 70. They were thrown out, and then later in AD 135. Uh, but there were always been Jews living in the land, and, and so the Jews have, you know, always had a good memory of that. And they've, God has always promised in the Bible 
you know, Deuteronomy 30 and many places, that even though she'll be scattered to the nations, God will regather her from those nations and reestablish her as a nation. And so it's a modern miracle that this actually happened in 1948. So definitely it's the land. Israel is not possessing her full land yet. Um, because she's not fully in fellowship with God. But in the millennium, Israel will possess her full land. Amen. So she was scattered from the land, and, and it's symbolized by the fig tree. When she's scattered, she's seen as individual figs. But when she's back in the land, she's the she is the fig tree in the land. This one's from Kay, and we just wrote, uh, talked about Kay, the attacks that they were receiving. Um, and Kay is saying, we are not married, and the attacks are from the outside. But God works all for good. And that's from Kay. Amen. Keep your faith strong, Kay. Well done to you. Okay, this next one here is, uh, many thanks for your answers on our questions. Thank you for a wonderful program this evening. Thank you very much for that. Uh, this one is from Lloyd. Hi, when is the new earth created? Yes, at the end of the thousand years, it says that the first heaven and the first earth uh, disappear. There is no space found for them. In other words, they, the whole time-space universe ceases to exist. God folds it up, as it were. And then you'll see, if you read on, uh, I think it's right at the start of Revelation 21, it talks about that God will create a new heaven and a new earth. And then the new Jerusalem comes down from God's heaven and lands on the, uh, the new earth. And that's what we call the eternal state. Paulette and Ken has written, St. Dear Cyrus and Pastor Derek, thank you for all the information. This is all that we are praying for over this weekend is for peace. We are so thankful for, uh, that Jesus is sovereign in the thanks that he has saved us. God's blessings, Paulette and Ken. Thank you so much indeed for that. Uh, this one is saying um, from Wendy. My name is Wendy from Wales. Uh, could this attack be because God is trying to get his people's hearts turned back to him and call out to him to save them as he did in the past? Thank you and God bless. Well, kind of, yes. I always like to distinguish. I don't believe God is the author of evil. Nevertheless, God works all things together for good. And part of God's purpose through the tribulations that Israel is facing and will continue to face is that it will break her, her pride, uh, as it were, and break her self-reliance so that she has to turn to God. And this is, happens in individual people's lives too. Often, when everything goes well for somebody, they don't give God a second thought. When they go through troubles, then, some, then sometimes that's an opportunity for them to turn to God. And, and so it's not that God causes the evil things, but God works his purposes out through them. Okay, this next one says, uh, let's see what we have here. Um... Uh, this one's from John, who wrote in earlier about the anger issue. He says, I've got anger issues and I'm taking anger management courses. And that's from John. Thank you, John. We're praying for you, buddy. Um, this one here is next one. Is it possible? Hello, Derek. Is it possible to get the original manuscript? Uh, no, we don't have the original manuscripts because, they, you know, they were originally written say on you know they, they haven't survived put it that way but what we do know is that the the he the, the hebrew copyists were copied with exact detail so what we have is a lot of manuscripts that go back to within you know you know a, you know a few hundred years sometimes uh and we have lots of those manuscripts, so we can be very sure about what the original manuscript was. But we don't have in our possession the the actual manuscript that Paul wrote or Peter wrote or anything like that. But what we do have is an abundant, and we don't have that in in any um, you know any any author mm. from the ancient history like Julius Caesar or anything like that. Um, but what we do have is an abundance of manuscripts that go back a long way in time that 
because uh, they people believed it was the word of God, they copied it very exactly. But it does mean that there are a few little variations between the manuscripts we have. Nothing major, nothing that affects any major doctrine. Um, but there are, you know, variations as as we as we talked about. And so certain verses, there are nuances uh, different between the verses depending on the manuscript. And I tend to judge each one on on its own merits okay. as to which it, which is correct. This one here is from Peter. Say, how Pastor Derek, you mentioned God said man will never be able to measure the extent of the universe. Do you know which chapter of Jeremiah that is? And also, apart from Jeremiah, are there any scriptures to back this up? In about a minute, if you can, Derek. Yeah, offhand, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I'll, I'll have a search, but probably you should go on to the next. Um, okay. Did God send Martin Luther to to bring God's word back? And that's from John. Yeah, but God used John, Martin Luther was not a perfect man by any means, but God used him to bring the revelation of justification by faith. And what an awesome revelation! And how important was that? Plus other ref ways in which were, were necessary reformations of bringing the church back to the word of God. That's true. Pastor Derek. We've got your details on screen. We've got your website there, the oxfordbiblechurch.co.uk. Very briefly, explain to our viewers the free content that is available on there. Yeah, on our website, we've got a lot, lot of articles and uh, we've got our online shop. But, you know, if there's any, any books and stuff you're interested in, you could check that out. And, uh, yeah, also information about our church services at Oxford Bible Church. So uh, do, do, Brilliant. do check Brilliant. out. A lot of free book materials. Some of my books are, are available online there as well. Amen. Pastor Derek Walker, I want to say a huge thank you as always. Thank you so much for joining us on the Q&A show and God oh, bless you and, uh, and Hillary. Uh, Cyrus, can I just say, Jeremiah 31, 37. There you go. You got it just in time. Well done. And I just pray for whatever you're going through in your life, you draw closer to Jesus Christ. We'll be back next time live on Revelation TV, Mondays at 10 o'clock, the Q&A show. Check out our website, revelationtv.com. God bless and bye-bye.